Hey, what is up everyone? It's Rich. All right, welcome to a video. This is going to be a brand new series. This just happened very organically this morning. Um, I can give you a little quick backstory on how this uh, came to be. So um, I, I had mentioned on Instagram that uh, like Facebook, you know, I have to check it just because it's like I have a few contacts that, that uh, seem to lean towards that as their main way of communicating with me so so i i have to go in and check it anyway when you log in facebook will generally share memories with you and a lot of times it's like your old posts i mean it's always your old posts but um you know it would share art with me and and most of the time i'm just kind of like ah whatever or, you know you kind of go oh yeah i remember when i posted that but um a couple of mornings when when it did it i i kind of started scrolling through the images and it was chunks of uh, in particular uh, the work that I had done with uh, David Finch, and um, I found that enough time had gone by that it was it was more interesting to me than I would have I would have imagined. I don't really go back and look at a lot of my old stuff, and in particular, if I do, it's very kind of like a doctor like or a mechanic like looking at an engine. I don't really like I wouldn't say enjoy it would be. Um, like I don't, I don't not enjoy it, but it's, it's a different experience when you've worked on it. And it's like, I don't really sit and actually even pick apart my techniques. I just have no interest in really seeing it. And what I found is it, that, that enough time had gone by that I was like, oh, this is kind of cool to look at. And so what I did is I had been saving a bunch of images on my computer from Facebook and, um, I've been posting them on Instagram and, and people seem to be getting a kick out of it. And it's, it's fun for me for a few reasons is is one um it's it's something that i have a lot of stockpiled i mean i could i've um i think david and i probably did between four and five hundred pages together including covers and stuff like that so there's a tremendous amount of art a lot of it really hasn't been seen a lot of the interior pages and whatnot are are kind of um you know sometimes that stuff isn't the most glamorous you know pieces it's, it's like people you know, in, in particular on, on something like um, Instagram, you know, you want a money shot. Um, but anyway, so so what I thought I would do is I, I was like, man, you know, if I'm doing that, I might as well actually do a YouTube series and, and just focus on a single page. So the, the idea is it's going to be called Beyond the Page. And uh, I'm going to focus on one, you know, sequential page or cover. This happened to be a cover. The only reason I picked it is there's a pretty interesting story to this piece. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I think this will be really fun. So I will create a playlist as I start to compile more of these. And you're always going to be able to find these because they're always going to have the same background. It's going to be a green background. It's going to be very easy to spot in the like slew of all my videos. Because that was one problem that I found a couple of years back as I was really racking up a lot of videos. Was It's just difficult for people to find stuff. And most people don't search the channel, unfortunately. So, I mean, it's not uncommon to be asked, like, hey, you should do an Alex Ross video. And you're like, oh, I did one yesterday. And they're like, oh, okay, wow, I, I didn't know. Someone was sharing Alex Ross art on Twitter this morning, and <laughs> I didn't see your video. So, anyway, let's get to this. All right, so this is interesting. If you're a fan of David Finch and Forever Evil, you're like, I've seen this piece, Rich. This was the cover for issue six. And you would be right, and you would also be wrong. <laughs> so, let's get into this. First... Here is the published cover. I will show um, something else in a second too. So this was uh, penciled and I don't know if it was inked or just turned into inks um, somehow. But if you actually look closely, you're gonna see some things. Horrible things, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but um, yeah, if you, if, you, if you really go through and start looking at the line work, what you're gonna see that the piece that I did is quite different. So anyway, for whatever reason, David had to do this piece on his own. You can see up here, you know. Um, uh, I don't know if it was penciled and turned inks. I don't know if it was uh, penciled and digital inked, but, but, but I get the impression that maybe this doesn't exist as an original. And I'll explain why in a second. So anyway, we had an art collector after we were done with Forever Evil who bought all the covers, but he didn't have this cover. For whatever reason, this cover didn't exist in a way that he could buy it. So he commissioned me to basically do a recreation of the cover so he could have the full set because, you know, most collectors, it's like, you know, you're pretty particular and you're trying to, you know create full runs and you know i mean there's there's a level of completion that you need in collecting so anyway i i re-penciled the full piece 
on an 11 by 17 board. I probably light boxed the most main structure and then went in and drew it. I don't think my lines are one for one for David, but some of the placements I'm sure are pretty accurate. Uh, so yeah, so I penciled this whole thing and then I re-inked it and, and um, you know, this, this owner has this now. Um, he owns like a pretty huge book chain in the Philippines, in fact, like almost like Crown Books or one of those kind of things. He's, you know, uh, his, his family is, is, I'm assuming pretty, um, you know, like, I don't know if they're known there, but uh, it's a huge bookstore chain. But anyway, so this is the piece. Um, it's 11 by 17. It was inked on, you know, DC Comics Bristol board. I'm going to show you really quick the, the tools that I used. So for people that are always trying to wonder, like, what do professional artists use? So my croquil of choice, which is the pen, meaning like um, if you were going to use like a Micron or Copic Multiliner, one of the tools I use is a Hunt 102. So I found out about Hunt 102s by reading uh, probably either Wizard Magazine or like Inside Image. And just about any comic book creator that was working when I was getting interested in comics, Todd McFarlane, everyone at Wildstorm, everyone at Top Cow, whatever, all those guys, like the, the people that I was starting to get interested in their art, all usually would reference that they used uh, Hunt 102 pens. And if it was good enough for Todd McFarlane, then that was what I needed in my life. So I use this exact thing. I have probably a hundred boxes of them here at the house. They're not so cheap though. I mean, I used to think that they were about a dollar a nib, but I would say that a box of pen nibs will cost you anywhere from like 12 to 20 bucks. It might be a little bit more. So I use Winsor Newton brushes. Um, I use series seven numbers two, or I'll use a three and sometimes I'll even use a four. Um, I don't like smaller brushers, so I've never been a fan of ones or zeros and all that. I, I can get just as thin of a line with a four as I could with probably a zero, zero, zero brush. So I don't mess with them. I, I think that they're kind of, I don't know. They're not my thing. Um, this is the pen holder that holds the Hunt 102 nibs. You can get fancier ones like this. They have ones that are custom made. You just want to make sure that the size of it will fit a 102 nib. This is what it looks like with the pen nib in for people. I'm not going to do this on every video. And then this is the ink that I use. I use Ultra Draw. So... It's a great ink. I've been using it literally since I was in high school. I didn't even start drawing comics till many years after high school. So this has just been in my life in terms of an ink because uh, I had a friend that drew with River Pittographs is um, a teenager and he had the gray Kohenor Rapidograph, and so I bought one of those, and then I would use this ink to fill it. Um, the only other thing that I was gonna mention is when you buy these brown pen holders, there are two versions of it. You just wanna be careful. You want the one with the hollow tip. I refer to it as the female. I don't know if they do, but there is another version of this that actually will have like a little stud inside of it like this, and you would think that a crow quill, like a pen nib like this, would go around it. That was what I thought. I didn't I didn't know when I bought them. I bought like 10 of them from an art store. And when this thing is inside of it, that pen nib will not go in it. I, I thought that it maybe saddled around it, you know, and the, the pen nib kind of, you know, went like, you know, like that. It will not work. You definitely, definitely, definitely want to get the hollow one. So don't get the other one. So anyway, those are the tools of the trade. These brushes are pretty expensive. Um, when you're newer to inking, you're going to burn through them a lot faster than, than I will. Um, I used to buy these, these were about 20 bucks, something like that. I mean, they would maybe last me a month and I would just destroy them. So it's unfortunate, but it's just kind of the growth curve with using those tools. So, all right, now let's get to the piece. <laughs> Isn't this exciting? Again, there won't be so much preamble on all of these as we move forward, but Every few videos, I'll revisit the tools so that, that the tool junkies can get it. So anyway, a lot of times when people will look at areas like this, the hair, they see those feathery lines and they go, aha, I know what that technique is. He used a brush there. Now, I believe that I did, but, but to be clear, you can get this same look with like a micron, like a Pigma micron. Um, you could get it with um, uh, a Copic multiliner. It just really depends on your hand control and if you want to feather lines. So many, many times when I ink pieces, I'm really not very conscious of the tools that I'm grabbing. And in fact, it's it's I've had professional inkers 
you know, you like maybe meet him at a comic book convention and they'll see a piece and they'll go, what did you do to like ink this area right here? I honestly will not really have an idea. <laughs> I, I don't pay attention. I don't really know. Visually, I can't really tell. Um, sometimes I can. I mean, the a Hunt 102 will kind of carve into the paper. So what you'll get is you'll get a little bit of a more shiny looking line. And also, um, it tends to be just blacker. Brush ink and stuff like that will sometimes look a little more translucent. Like if you zoom in here, you can kind of see that this probably was brushed. The way that I figured it out, honestly, was by looking at this area over here. Yeah. This area right here was the toe. Is that like yeah right here just when these lines got thicker that was how i could tell i'm not you know i'll be honest like like i because i've dealt with this on youtube and other places there's some people that are really into like technique i'm not really that guy um to me te great technique is is so that i don't have to think about technique um but but i i generally squint my eyes and hold the page very very far away from my face and that's how i judge what i do i don't really look at the close detail um and i can just spot anomalies <clears throat> by by looking at a piece you know about like this size <clears throat> or this and if i see dark areas or areas where it's overly bright um that's where i'm going to start to focus in on and start to noodle more um one thing that i did notice when i looked at this piece that i thought was kind of interesting is so it's not a hard and fast rule, but if I'm working on something like flesh on a face, I will not use the same exact techniques on other materials. Materials meaning other physical objects like rope. So if you look at the, the, the way that I ink the rope, it doesn't really look like his face. I don't use the same things. Um, uh, you know, some people do, some don't, but I, I thought this was interesting too is so for some reason, I went in here and did a little bit more of a feathery, brushy thing um, as the light and the shadow was kind of going through here. But if you notice, I actually did balance the piece out. I was not aware that I did it, but I thought it was interesting. Is right there I did it, and right there I did it. And things like that will keep a level of stability in the art. The other thing that I recommend to people, and then I'm going to wrap this up. We're going to be done. <laughs> Splatter. If you notice on this piece, I'm only using white splatter. Now, you can definitely use white and black splatter on pieces, but I'm gonna give you a word of warning. Your pal Rich is gonna give you a bit of advice that you've probably never heard before. As you start to put black and white splatter on a piece, you're starting to really blur the level of values that are going on in a piece. And what I mean by that is it starts to get less focused. Now. The people that you'll see that can get away with using black and white splatter on pieces generally have pretty simple art. It's usually very, very high contrast and very graphic looking. If you have a lot of detail and you start to put a lot of white and black splatter on a piece, what you're going to kind of get is you're going to get just a, a kind of a mess. It's not going to have the same focus and, and sort of ballsiness as solid with a little bit of diffusion so use it you you don't have to agree with me you don't have to believe what i'm saying you could try it and see if you feel what i said might potentially be right or wrong it's up to you um but but um i i think um it'll help some people possibly there was something else i was going to say too it was um what was it? it? Had something to do with splatter. I, I, and I really would avoid doing black and white splatter over each other. Um, I mean, again, I, I'm fans of you know artists that use techniques like that, but I mean, you're really gonna kind of you're running yourself into the red. God, there was something I was gonna say. Oh, it was um, there was a page that I shared on Instagram that Scarecrow in a cabin. And there's a big cast shadow. On it you can I'll have a link to my Instagram in the description box you can check it out I uploaded it a day or two ago uh, but I said when I posted it, I said there was there was a temptation when I was inking the piece to go in and put a lot of detail um, in the wood grain and and you know break up the shadow and stuff like that but ultimately I decided to to play it straight and I used the shadow as a really really strong design element on the page why I don't know but I actually I stand by the decision and i think it was the right call and and i think that 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 it's like 
I think I kind of described it as this. It's like I can show off and put detail everywhere, but ultimately what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give a person that looks at the art the the most powerful and and I think interesting piece of art that they can look at, and then also something that has some replay value. Um, and you know you can use your imagination of what that means but but I, I like to do pieces of art that I think that you can return to and look at them again and again um, and it's not always possible especially if I haven't drawn them um, you know if I didn't pen pencil it I can't really control exactly what the the, the overall image is going to be but anyway when you're working with someone like david finch he sets you up for victory so credit to david finch on this one it was a really neat opportunity to return this piece i mean i remember not you know not inking it and kind of wasn't a huge deal but you know it's always a bummer when one sort of slips through your fingers and uh it was a nice opportunity to do it and kind of show off so um you know this is at this point this probably was like the second biggest piece that i had ever inked in terms of like the size of a head on a board sounds funny but the only other one that we did that was this big was um a dark knight 10 cover has got a huge batman head on it like about like this size but um i had you know I, at wildstorm i don't think i ever really inked anything that that was like that it's it's just you know maybe the trend had kind of gone away, you know, like uh, the pit number one cover where it's just like a gigantic head, like on, on the cover. So uh, yeah, this was actually a big piece. And I mean, you definitely, um, it gives you the opportunity to put more detail on a piece. And also, um, uh, you know, there's a higher likelihood that any kind of mistakes and sort of missteps that you make uh, might show up. Sorry, right, have a great day. Hopefully that was helpful. And um, yeah, you know, just, uh, like I said, you want to learn the rules so you can throw them all out. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. I, I, uh, yeah, that's interesting. I was definitely disciplined when I was learning, but I don't know. I squint my eyes, I throw the page on the ground, and I just look at it. And that's how I decide if it looks right or not. I swear it's the truth. Um, so, all right. Have a great day. I'll talk to you later. Bye.